Today's guest is Dr. Robert Melillo, and be prepared to be blown away. This episode is so good. Um, if you don't follow Dr. Melillo on Instagram, I recommend you do so. Uh, over 800,000 other people agree with me on that. He is incredible. Um, he is a functional neurologist, professor, researcher, eight-time best, eight-time best-selling author, and co-founder of Brain Balance Centers and founder of the Melillo Method. We are getting all up into the brain and how it works. And we're talking right side of the brain, left side of the brain. And if you think that's BS, you know, cause you heard that through the grapevine, listen to this episode. <laughs> it's so good. So we're gonna get into all sorts of neurological conditions such as ADHD, OCD, autism, tics, dyslexia, anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, you name it, we're getting into it today. Um, he has extensive knowledge of brain function and he has a non-invasive multi-modality method to help improve many of these conditions. Um, he's also very well, he's very well known in the field of autism. Um, his book, Disconnected Kids, just released his third edition. Um, he has several other books, Reconnected Kids, um, and a book called, just called Autism, all, all by Dr. Robert Melillo. There's also a nutrition plan, one for, for kids with autism. Oh my goodness, I'm just gonna not waste any more time because I want you to hear every single minute of this episode. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get right in here, into it. Here is Dr. Robert Melillo. Okay, so Dr. Melillo, I'm so excited to share with the audience today what you're talking about in terms of how our brains actually operate and how some of the symptomology that so many are experiencing in terms of anxiety to OCD, to bipolar, to schizophrenia, to autism, to you know, dyslexia, like just all of these neurological issues happening in the brain that no one really understands. Like, I don't know anyone with any of those issues that's really being served all that well, you know? It's kind of like, I have this. Yep, and that's kind of where it ends. So. Um, to kind of set some framework, I was wondering if we could start with um, a big part of your work, which is understanding uh, brain asymmetry and how that plays into all these different conditions. Yeah, I think that's great. That's really an ideal place to start because, um, you know, for me, all of those things, all of those names or labels or whatever you want to call them, diagnosis, really um, speak to me from a neurology standpoint or from a brain perspective, meaning I think, well, what is actually happening in the brain in this? What is happening in the brain that's different in ADHD versus dyslexia versus depression versus anxiety? And, and most people don't think like that. They just put a label on and then everything is kind of lumped under that label, whether it actually fits or not. Um, and then people identify with their labels and their labels may be completely wrong. I, I probably, at least 50% of people that come in my office, I believe their diagnosis is completely wrong. It's a, it's a mislabeling of people. Um, so it really starts with understanding the brain. And really, you, if you, you can't look at anything in really psychology or psychiatry at all without understanding brain asymmetry. That's the only way it makes sense, really. And that was actually a quote uh, by a famous neuro neuroscientist named Tim Brown. He said, nothing in human psychology or psychiatry makes sense unless you look at it in light of brain asymmetry. So um, real quick synopsis of that, you know, we have two parts, two sides of our brain, and it's very important. It's actually a great advantage. Humans have the most asymmetric brains of any animals. We know our brain is more asymmetric. Um, and that is an advantage because it's like having two brains in one. And one side of the brain can do one thing while another side of the brain can do another thing. So Ian McGilchrist, who's a very famous psychiatrist who wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary and a number of other books, who really is, uh, again, one of the experts of brain asymmetry, describes it by saying, you know, um, you know, imagine a bird and a bird is looking for a seed on the ground. And it needs to be able to see this little seed amongst all these pebbles. And so it needs to be able to be able to find that fine detail and be able to separate that, right? That's what the left brain does. But at the same time, the right name brain needs to be looking out for any predators that might be about to attack it at the same time. So both sides of the brain, one needs to be looking at the details of the seed and find it. 
which is critical to survival. The other one needs to be protecting it and making sure that we're not being attacked. And that's critical for survival. And both of them should be happening at the same time, but they're both doing completely opposite jobs, even though they're both active, right? So that's kind of an example of, you know, why we have two sides of the brain, why that's important and how that's important to remember. Because now, you know, for some reason, and I, I actually know the reason, there, there was some skepticism about the idea of the right brain and left brain and does it really work that way and is that an, mm -hmm. an, an, an old myth? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that got started somehow. It's like one of those weird things that started on the internet with an article and now everybody right. believes it. But it's mm -hmm. completely untrue. I mean, like the idea that the right brain and the left brain are different and do different things is one of the most you know foundational things in neuroscience and there's unbelievable amounts of literature going back but people believe well the whole brain is working and yes that's true the whole brain is working whenever we're working but the right and the left brain are doing different things and in many cases complete opposite things but from the brain and from a lot of the imaging that we do even in research you can't really tell what the different jobs are, you just see both of them lighting up at the same time. Mm -hmm. So people got the impression, well, it isn't either the right or the left. Both are always working, yes, but they do very different jobs. Can you elaborate a little more on the jobs of the right and left brain and what people might experience when one of those is like, is underactive and overactive the right wording you would use? Or yeah, pretty much. To their roles yeah. and what, what we experience when one is underperforming or one is overperforming? Yes. So the right brain develops first in the womb. So how do we get a right brain and a left brain to begin with? It's not really genetically done. It's really done in really what we call more non-genetic means, which means that it's more based on the side of the brain that's more active during a particular developmental part of the of the brain development and what we're interacting with and that shapes one side of the brain and the right brain is more active in the womb and in the first three years so anything we're interacting with anything we're experiencing or how we experience it has more of an impact on the right brain and then the left brain kicks in for the next three years and so now those three years are also very different and we're having different experiences and and so that promotes different aspects of the left brain and that creates the right and left brain so the right brain because it develops first the first thing we need to do is survive so the most critical thing for survival for humans the reason why we've been around for all these millennia is because we get together as groups we protect one another so being social forming attachments forming relationships and maintaining them is the primary job of the brain from day one and should be we should be driven by that so again right away children should be attaching to their parents because they can't survive alone and then as soon as they can they should be reaching out for other children or their siblings or playing with other kids and then learning how to really socially navigate that learning subtle cues of when i'm doing things that this child doesn't like or you know i want this child to be friendly and it's all driven by we want people to like us we want people to take care of us because they may have to put their life on the line to protect us so they better like us and in the stone age you could not survive alone without a group and if you were kicked out of a group because you were a jerk or you didn't get along with people, it was literally a death sentence. So we have this thing in the right brain. Now, first, it starts with us feeling our body. So we connect to our body and we feel what's called interoception. So we, a baby needs to be able to early on be able to say, are they in pain? Are they hungry, thirsty, hot, cold? Do they need the bathroom to go to poop themselves? And um, you know, smell and taste are very much part of that, feeling tired. So those base feelings are really registered primarily in the right brain in an area called the right insula. This is also an area that we use eventually to empathize with other people. So we can't empathize. If I don't feel pain, I can't feel somebody else's pain, right? So my ability to connect with another person is based on my ability to first connect with myself and my own feelings. And then we develop emotions on top of that. And we have different emotions in the right brain versus the left brain. And the right brain are more to form social bonds or to make sure that we're fitting in with society or to protect us. So fear, sadness, 
guilt, shame, embarrassment, rejection sensitivity, but also empathy, love, connection. Those are really strong right brain emotions. So the right brain also gets the big picture and it sees the, you know, puts everything together. It, it, you know, feels our whole body and controls our whole body. And it's very connected to regulating our emotions so that a child eventually learns to self-soothe and to regulate. And a lot of that is based on the interaction between their parents in the beginning. So, you know, that face to face reading facial expression, nonverbal communication, being able to communicate without words, pointing, waving, all of that. So that's the first three years is about that. It's about feeling our body, connecting with our body, connecting with other people, getting the big picture, being outside in nature, reality. The left brain kicks in and now we start to form conscious memories. Before that, we don't really form conscious memories. From three on, we start to form conscious memories, and that's not really fully formed until more like five or six. So most people have what we call childhood amnesia. They don't remember before the age of three because that's when the right brain is supposed to be developing. Um, it doesn't mean we're not learning really important things. We just don't remember it. So also, if we don't learn it, like if we didn't learn how to socialize appropriately, we don't know we didn't learn it. Okay. Right. And so the left brain, now we start to form conscious memory and it's about, it's more about movement. It's more about motor. It's about setting goals, going out in the world. It's more consciously aware. It's more about accumulating knowledge and stuff. So seeking behavior, going out, figuring things out and forming a memory means having a timeline, past, present, future, predicting into the future, using our past to figure out what's going to happen next and then remembering that. And then, you know, reproducing it. The left brain likes patterns. It's sequential. It's logical. It's linear. It's verbal. So it's linguistic. So we have verbal, verbal language is really the left brain. And the left brain are things like math and academics and remembering dates and figures and things like that. And the left brain emotions are more going out there in the world, what we call approach behavior. So joy happiness, um, but also anger and pride. So, you know, being proud of ourselves and, you know, being confident, going out there into the world and being proud of ourselves. And if something gets in the way of our goal, we get pissed off and we push through it, right? So anger, the only really pure emotion of the left brain is anger. And the left brain is very detail oriented and it, it hears different frequencies of sound and light. And so, you know, that's kind of a synopsis of the left brain and the right brain. And so now if we look at, let's say, someone who has trouble with recognizing nonverbal communication, not connected to their body, not really driven by, you know, attachment or really driven by, you know, I must connect with other people, some somebody who's really prefers to be by themselves and may do a lot of repetitive things over and over. That's what we see in the autism spectrum or the right brain is also about mostly paying attention. So the right brain being deficient is what we see with ADHD. The left brain generates hyperactivity. It, it generates ticks like Tourette's or stimming behavior. It generates, you know, again, patterns that are over and over. The left brain, when it's overactive, that can produce OCD-like behavior. When the left brain is deficient and the right brain is overactive, we can get an overwhelming sense of danger and fear that something bad's going to happen. We can overread social cues and be overly impacted by other people's emotions. And that those two things is really what's creating a lot of anxiety in people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a left brain deficit, maybe someone who's dyslexic, they can't read. They may have dyscalculia, they can't do math or they can't remember facts. So they don't, they don't do well academically because they have trouble, you know, remembering details and facts and, and learning in a sequence. And they get bored really easily because the right brain likes novelty. It also impacts the immune system. The left brain activates the immune system. The right brain suppresses it. Mm -hmm. So with a right brain deficit, left brain overactive, we could have autoimmunity or food sensitivities or eczema. With a deficiency on the left, we can have chronic ear infections or get sick all the time. So that's a generalized idea right there. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, what about gut gut issues? What, what do you see that more often with? 
Yeah, the right brain and the left brain govern the balance of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So, you know, what we see is that we're all born with that sympathetic fight or flight system on high alert. And so when we're born, our gut is, we're naturally, our gut is open and leaky. Um, we're not really producing acid or enzymes yet because we're supposed to be just eating breast milk mm -hmm. or, or formula, which really doesn't need to be digested. It doesn't need a lot of blood flow in the gut to absorb that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're supposed to be getting our antibodies from the mother's breast milk. So mm -hmm. those are large proteins. So the gut needs to be open during that time. Um, over the first year, and as the baby starts ingesting solid food, now the gut needs to close up. We need to start producing acid and enzymes mm -hmm. and create the proper mm -hmm. um, pH balance. Um, we then increase blood flow because now we need to start absorbing nutrients, vitamins and minerals from our food. And the parasympathetic nervous system is kicking in to do that. It also is the rest and digest. So the fight or flight, you know, so being more constipated and having being really, you know, aroused and, and getting irritated easily like a small baby, not sleeping well. Um, that's more the fight or flight. The parasympathetic is the rest and digest. So then a baby starts to eat solid food and sleep through the night and, and soothe and calm themselves and slow the heart rate down. That's all governed by the brainstem and by the brain ultimately, and the right and left brain do it differently. The right brain is more about the parasympathetic. It's more about promoting digestion and uh, reducing inflammation in the body. The left brain is more about, you know, increasing the activation of the immune system, creating inflammation, and it's more about shutting down the gut. So we, you know, when the sympathetic is high, we shut down the gut and we move the blood to the arms and the legs and the brain for running or fighting. And if you're in a chronic state, what we see with either developmental delay on the right side or the left side, we see that they have chronic sympathetic activation and then they're not activating the parasympathetic. So they have gut issues. They may have digestive issues. Um, and this may also be associated with food sensitivities, but the problem does not start in the gut. The problem starts in the brain and brainstem. And so that is, I think, a misnomer um, with a lot of people in the nutrition world that, you know, say, well, it all starts in the gut. It doesn't. It actually starts in the brain. It doesn't mean that the gut isn't important. And that, does, that doesn't obviously contribute to food sensitivities and digestive issues and symptoms. Of course it does, but it doesn't start there. And the root cause is really in the brain and the brainstem. Mm, yeah, I relate to that because I've been through some very scary fight or flight traumatic events in my adult life. And I, as I hear you describe these things, I'm like, I think I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm perfectly balanced, but I feel like I definitely have access to both sides of those things. And I've always thought, I'm like, I can't believe I didn't get gut issues when I was going through all that. But also at the same time, like, even though, yes, I was in fight or flight and like, holy crap, what am I going to do? I was still able to like calm myself through that and find solutions and, you know, also still, you know, <laughs> manage my, you know, relationships. And so, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't, I don't feel like I went dominantly into one side, which must have somehow, somehow something with my brain must have allowed me to still you know, access my parasympathetic, even though I was going through a very stressful time. So I kind of relate to that from a personal experience. And I, I'm, before we kind of shift into, cause I want to get into like, that, can, I, that, can I just comment on what you oh, said? Yeah, cause, please. cause that was really good. And, and what you gave an example of is that what we know is that almost all even adult mental health issues, right? It all starts in childhood. So most people that have gut problems, have had chronic gut problems since they were born. Like they don't know a time when they didn't have it. Mm -hmm. um, and that also is related to the brain development, which is usually what causes a lot of their issues. Now, what I may speculate is that you may have had pretty good development and your brain developed appropriately. And so you didn't develop any of these neurological imbalances and you did not have an imbalance in the sympathetic or parasympathetic. You have a normal kind of flexible and so when you're faced with stresses that we're all going to be faced with, mm -hmm. you, you're dealt with it okay and your body mm -hmm. dealt with it okay. And mm -hmm. you didn't, so the stresses themselves don't cause 
gut issues. They don't cause brain imbalances, right? I mean, you know, if there's trauma or anything from the time you're born, that can contribute to it. It may cause psychological issues, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't take a toll on your body. But if you developed appropriately, you ha- you can figure it out and you can actually respond okay, which is what you just described. So I would say you probably had really pretty good brain development. And then when you had these things happen, you know, you it, it mm-hmm. have impacted you, but you handled it and you recovered from it because the basic mechanisms of adaptation were formed when they were supposed to be formed as a kid, as a child. And in those that don't develop those adaptations, that's where they really struggle. Yeah. Yeah. I feel uh, very fortunate because I mean, well, you know, on t- the topic of mental health, my parents were divorced when I was like a baby toddler. It was a very volatile relationship on my older siblings. There's five kids. I'm the youngest. They're like, thank goodness. It was horrible. My mom had probably undiagnosed schizophrenia. I'm pretty freaking sure. So single mom, schizophrenia, divorce. Like I'm kind of shocked that <laughs> But I I do resonate with what you're saying. Like she she did something right. I mean, she definitely loved us. You know, there was a lot of chaos, but I, I always knew my mom loved me. I never wondered that, you know, even though there were challenges. Um, And so maybe, you know, somehow the way she met my needs in those early years, like really helped with that. Um, But I'm curious, like, uh, I mean, I know it's a loaded question, but like what happens in childhood and brain development in those early years, typically, what are typical situations that you see where these get really off and they don't develop in a more balanced way? Yeah. So, you know, there can be a number of things that contribute to why these things kind of go off track. But what happens is that early on there, the brain, if it goes off its normal track in some way. Now, I always tell people, and I tell them this because it's absolutely true, that the people that are more vulnerable to the imbalances are those that are the most gifted. So, you know, this goes back to something that always kind of bugged me as a kid, that statement that said there's a thin line between genius and insanity, right? And we see it all the time with people that are, you know, incredibly creative, but, Mm -hmm. you know, they also suffer with horrible depression or you know, yeah. commit suicide or people that get, you know, that are unbelievably intelligent, but yet they have schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I always wondered, why is that? Why wouldn't somebody just be a genius and be happy? Like, you know, why do they always have to have this tragic thing or, you know, where did that come from? And so, you know, it really speaks to this imbalance that, you know, may, may develop. And so it starts with people that are most gifted in an area, um, are more vulnerable to an imbalance. Mm. So when, whenever we look at a trait, and again, these are built on normal traits. So, you know, if you have somebody, and the traits I look at is, are you more of a right brain or left brain dominant thinking person? You know, like you see the world and, and a little mm-hmm. bit more right brain or a little bit more left brain. Some people are extreme right brain. Some people are mm-hmm. extreme left brain. And that's not a bad thing. It's like saying you're extremely right-handed or left-handed. <laughs> Not one is better than the other, but we know that uh, people are either right-handed or left-handed. Yet, if you look in the brain, you won't really see an answer for why. You just know that they are. And that's kind of the way our personality traits are as well. We kind of see the world a little bit more. And so when you have any sort of trait, it can give you an advantage, right? So if somebody has an unusual skill or gift, they're a great athlete, they're a great artist, they're incredibly intellectual, they have a phenomenal memory, whatever, it tends to run in families. You know, you see families of people that are all engineers or people that are all artists or people that are all athletes. These are family traits and these skills. And they tend to reside on one side of the brain or the other in certain networks in one side of the brain or the other. And someone that has a really strong version of that trait is gifted. That's what a gift is. When someone's really super intelligent, what does that mean? It means that that area of their brain that we're calling in that part of intelligence is more tightly connected. It's stronger. It's got, it's faster. It wow. processes faster. So it translates into literally a physical biological change in the brain in that area. Mm-hmm. And what we know with traits is that when a trait in one area is really strong, the opposite trait tends to be a little low. Wow. So, and that's the way it works. And that's an advantage 
So as a trait gets stronger, it gets more and more and more. So if somebody is, let's say, more left brain dominant and they have really strong skills and they're really good in math mathematics, that is a great trait. But on the right side, they may not be so good at reading people or they may not be able to regulate some of their emotions as well. And so then that, sk that skill, as it goes through the generations, if it gets stronger and stronger and stronger, they may have this genius level skill where they could literally calculate numbers in their head instantaneously. Or I have kids that, you know, instantaneously can tell you if you give them your birthday, when you were born, what day of the week you were born, who was president of the United States, right? So yeah. this skill that's just incredible, like huge numbers, they can immediately calculate. So that's that high skill. But what happens is that the right side is so low Mm -hmm. And when they go over a certain point, the disability outweighs the strength. And now we end up. So it starts with this gift. And then if something goes awry to, you know, make that gift come online too early um, or too late, or, it, you know, there's some other factor. And the most common thing is that something interferes with early movement. So movement is what the reason why brains evolved on this planet is because an animal moved and if you don't move if you're just a plant you don't need a brain but as soon as you start to move in some sort of purposeful way you need a brain and babies brains develop first through movement and human babies are very immature and they don't have control over their movement so they're born with these things called primitive reflexes that allow them to do basic simple movements like, you know, root and suck so they can feed themselves or grasping reflexes or startle responses or the way they turn their head makes their arms and legs move so they can get out of the womb and they can roll over and crawl in their bellies. And all those motor milestones are really important, even though during COVID, the CDC came out with something that said that they're not important anymore and that crawling isn't actually a milestone anymore. Wow. Um, and we're supposed to say, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, but those motor milestones are really important. And what I've been able to show with my research that I think right now, I'm, 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 I would say, you know, that I've written more than anybody else in the world right now on when these reflexes are, they're supposed to go away at the end of one year. And a child should be walking and talking at one year. And if they don't, it's usually because these reflexes are not going away when they're supposed to. And then they hold back the brain. And then they also lead to this imbalance between one hemisphere or the other that usually favors the individual strengths too much and emphasizes their weakness too much. And now this ends up being a disability. And depending on the level of the imbalance, so like a right brain deficit, a, a mild right brain deficit might be ADHD type 2 or type one, type 3. Um, a little bit more, maybe more like what we look at, like used to call like Asperger's or a little bit more might be OCD, a little bit more might be Tourette's, a little bit more might be autism, a little bit more might be non-speaking autism, a little bit more maybe schizophrenia, right? So it's, it, and there's more areas of the brain and more imbalances develop, but, and the symptoms come from overactivity in networks on one side usually the naturally strong side and then underdevelopment or underactivity on the other. And the combination of those is how you can explain almost every mental health issue that's out there from childhood till, you know, even probably neurodegeneration. Wow. What about bipolar? Where does that come in on that? Yeah, so, so bipolar, you know, again, when you look at the traits, right? So we know that like autism and schizophrenia, the, the family trait is really more what we call an intellect trait, meaning the people that are highly intelligent academically, they tend to be, you know, engineers or physicists or mathematicians or professionals. They usually do really well in school, um, but maybe not so good socially, um, you know, maybe not really reading other people as well. Um, bipolar is more common in people that have what, what we call a creativity trait. So people that are more right brain dominant tend to be more bipolar. And so we know that depression is decreased activity in the left frontal lobe. 
And so decreased activity in the left frontal lobe is going to decrease joy and happiness and lower motivation. Increased frontal lobe activation on the right is going to increase sadness and also possibly guilt and shame. So if we look at sadness or lack of joy, too much sadness combined with guilt or shame, that's depression. That's the definition of major depressive disorder. So this imbalance like that, and we see that. So bipolar, what we tend to see, it's it's overactive in right brain networks and underactive in left. And many of the, the manic features tend to be more like creative outbursts or like working out like a maniac or, you know, doing things like, you know, thinking about goals and future or whatever. So, you know, what we see typically with bipolar and and is usually this overactive right, this underdeveloped late left. And we see that the manic is more, they have these maybe creative bursts. And the more they do that, the more they drive down that left brain and the more that results in depression. And then they have depression. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. So interesting. I love, I'm loving all of this. Um, okay. So, um, let's, let's shift a little bit and there's so many things I want to ask you. I want to make sure I get to it. All. Let's shift a little bit into, um, like, okay, so we have this, we, you know, and I love how you're saying it's, it's kind of like being right-handed or left-handed. It's like removing all this like shame and stigma and like the what's wrong with me. And it kind of brings you into the now of like, well, here we are, here we are now what, you know? And I think that kind of shifts us pretty well into your, your centers, your Melillo method, you know? So if you're listening to this and you're like, woo, that is me. Like I am definitely like super right brain dominant. Like everything he's saying is making sense. What, what, what now in order to, you know, bring a little bit more symmetry to the brain? Yeah. And that's the thing. I think that, you know, from the time when I came out with my first book, Disconnected Kids, which we just came out with the third edition this week. Um, when people started reading it right from the beginning, the overwhelming response was, this makes so much sense. Yeah. Or how do you know my kid? Like yeah. th- you've just described my child. And by the way, you described me, the parent, right? And it was this like, that's the whole thing. It makes so much sense when you start to understand it. And that's where, you know, I mean, when we, when we look at mental health issues, if you're depressed, you know, people will generally think, well, I must be a weak person because why am I depressed or why am I getting sadder than anybody else? And everybody else would handle this better than me. And so there must be some sort of character flaw or, you know, chemical imbalance, which doesn't exist. Uh, rather than understanding that, no, you're probably really gifted in the right side of your brain and all the good things that you can do is part of that. But there's a vulnerability and that vulnerability could be depression, but it's just this biological imbalance and you can change it at any given time. And that's the, that's the theme. I think that people can feel like, oh, I can change. I can even fix myself. If I understand my own brain, I can learn how to do this. And so we have to think instead of, of the brain as this chemical thing, so that we think that only drugs are going to help it, or maybe vitamins or supplements. We have to think of it more in biological terms that it's kind of, it's an organ like a really like complicated muscle, but it's something that we have to use it and we have to fine tune it and we have to coordinate it to work together. And so it's all about what we call functional connectivity. It's about creating this communication flow and balance and making sure that the brain is resonating in the right frequencies. And we change that by activating the brain and by activating it specifically, not just generally stimulating the brain because that won't correct an imbalance. We have to target certain areas and activate those, the ones that are underactive or underdeveloped. And then we have to calm down or quiet the other ones. So when we see, like I said, if we look at something like someone who may have OCD, they have this overactivity of the left frontal lobe area and they have these obsessive thoughts that they can't stop and then the orbital frontal cortex on the left creates these compulsive behaviors that they have to do and normally the right side would inhibit that it would stop that from happening 
We do something we need to do. We think about something we need, and then we need to shut it off so that we can move on to the next thing. But if we get stuck and it's constantly like a broken record, we can't stop it. It's really because this is too active and this is underactive. So we need to quiet that down because now as this gets overactive, it is holding back the other side of the brain. It's pushing down on the other side and the other side can't come up. And at a certain point, it's just, it can't over it because we're feeding that left brain so much. Someone that's ADHD, like truly hyperactive, impulsive, um, you know, can't pay attention. All They're constantly feeding their brain, looking for more things like, you know, doing this, I need to do this, I need to move, I need to do this, I need to change. They're constantly feeding the left brain. And they can't engage the right brain, which would give them the ability to have sustained attention. So what we need to do is we need to do things that will activate the brain. Um, so it depends. If we want to affect the auditory system, we need to do sound. We need to do different frequencies of sound. Different types of music are more specific to the right brain versus the left brain. Mm -hmm. If we want to do visual parts of the brain, we need to do visual stimulus, eye movements or flashing lights or different colors or do different types of visual processing skills. If we want to work on smell, we need to work on smell. We need to use smell. If we need to work on, um, you know, feeling our body more, we need to work on tactile. We may need vibration. If we need to work on, you know, moving our body better or more coordinatively, then we need to do physical exercise and activities. But we need to target different areas of the brain on one side and calm it down on the other. So we can also use things that will activate the brain directly. So there's different tools that we have, um, things like transcranial direct current or alternating current. We have other different a little electrical stimulating devices we can use. We can do cognitive based activities. Um, you know, we could do math problems. We could read a book. Uh, we could focus on reading comprehension versus word reading. Word reading is more of a left brain skill. Reading comprehension is a right brain skill. So we also, you know, can do things like, you know, like neurofeedback to target different networks on one side of the brain. But because most of this starts in early childhood and it impacts usually some movement and maybe these things called retained primitive reflexes, the brain builds from the bottom up. So it starts in the brain stem and then it builds in layers. So these reflexes come from the bottom of the brain stem called the medulla area. And that's also the area that regulates our digestive system and our balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic and our inner ear system. And so all of this is happening there. And then that should mature. And as it matures, these reflexes go away. And now the bottom of our brain, the foundation of our brain is solid. Now we go on to the next layer and the next layer, and then we build our brain and then our brain comes down and regulates everything. And at the same time, we're getting integration of the left and right hemispheres. So bottom up leads to then what we call top down. Top down activities are basically thinking, you know, learning, reading, high level cognitive skills, socializing, you know, modifying your own behavior. And a lot of treatments out there really target right off the bat the, the top down part like talk therapy, uh, neurofeedback, or if we're doing something directly to the brain, or if we're trying to teach a child how to read or do math, um, these are all what we call top-down therapies, or we're doing behavioral interventions. And they don't work really well if you haven't done the bottom up. Mm. So you need to do the bottom up first, and then you can do the top down. So you need to get rid of the reflexes. You need to do movement. You need to do sensory stimulation. You need to do things with, you know, vision or eye movements or sound or, you know, balance or inner ear, tactile. You need to do physical body work first to balance. And then you can layer on top the top down therapies. But a lot of the reason why the therapies don't work is because they don't understand 
this. I mean, you know, psychology, I, I have a degree in neuropsychology. I understand psychology, but they don't, they don't learn anything about the, the physical body and, you know, motor development and sensory development and how that builds the foundation of cognitive skills and emotional regulation and all of the things that we do. Um, they don't, they don't get training in that. They don't know that, right? Um, uh, you get someone who's, you know, uh, an MD just doing prescription. They also, they're not, they're not looking at that. They're looking at, okay, how can we maybe chemically change the brain? So you need to have a real holistic view, a true holistic view. You have to know about all aspects of the body and how it works and then how it will impact, you know, diet and nutrition, which is also another important part of it. But again, it's not the primary part of it. So it really comes down to, you know, knowing how to activate, stimulate the brain, balance and do it in a balanced way and then support it with diet and nutrition and lifestyle in, in the proper way. And you, you have centers, correct? Like brain balance centers. Is that what, it, is that what it's called? Well, yeah, I, I was the founder, co-founder of brain balance achievement centers and okay. I helped create them. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't do my, I don't do anything with them anymore. Okay. I, I moved on to the next thing was developing this thing called the Melillo method. And Got now it. we, and now we have a center um, we have a center on Long Island and we're developing okay. one in New York City called the, uh, the Melillo Center for Developing Minds. And mm -hmm. so this is more, the brain balance was more like learning center model and was for a, a different population. Mm -hmm. This was more about, all right, really, really trying to help the most challenging issues at all age groups that are out there and really trying to understand things at the deepest level, like, you know, right. why, why doesn't a kid with autism speak or what is actually happening in the brain in schizophrenia or, or bipolar? And how do we actually change that? Mm -hmm. um, which is a much more complex thing to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I've, I have two offices in New York, one will be opening soon. But one, my primary one is on Long Island right now in New York. The name of it, uh, the Melillo Center for Developing Minds is making me smile because I saw a guy on your Instagram that was like, he was, had, you know, uh, is it like a EEG or some sort of, he had some sort of thing on it, you know, all these little sensors on his head and someone was asking him what it was like. He's like, I feel like I'm like on X-Men or something. I'm trying to like move <laughs> this stuff with my mind, you know, so calling yeah. it the Center for Developing Minds, I'm like, it's making me smile. It's perfect. And yeah, yeah, I love you guys really are on the you're I love the way you're looking at this and thinking about this. And yeah, uh, it's it, 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 that's what that one lady, you know, what you said, people said when they read your autism book was what I was saying out loud to myself as I was listening to your podcast on YouTube. I'm like, this makes so much sense. Yeah, this makes so much sense, you know, and yeah. it, because as you're listening to it, it's like, oh, I know that person with anxiety or that person with OCD or that person with bipolar or that person with schizophrenia. And, and yep, yep, yep. It's like all matching up. My question is like, I don't know your thoughts on this. You know how sometimes people will be told that they have bipolar and ADHD or something like that. What are your thoughts on that? Because those would be two different dominance. Yeah, that was, that was great. You're like read my mind because <laughs> as you were saying that, I'm saying the only caveat here is that, you know, like, again, many people have the wrong labels or they group a bunch of labels together because mm -hmm. really what most diagnosticians do is they're just ticking boxes, right? Right. Oh, you fit this box, you fit ADHD, right. you're ADHD, but you also tick some of these boxes. Right. So we're going to say you're dyslexic right. or we're going to say you have anxiety and depression mm -hmm. when neurologically those things are the opposite of one another, right? Yeah. So they really can't coexist, mm -hmm. but the labels coexist. And one of them is usually probably not an accurate diagnosis. And there are different right and left brain versions. So for instance, you know, ADHD, um, people come in and they'll say, well, my son is ADHD or I'm ADHD. And I'll say, okay, well, what type? Cause there's three types, type one, type two, type three. Most people go, what? Like, I, I never knew that. I never knew there were different yeah, I types. I didn't know that. <laughs> right. And I just thought there was ADHD. And so that's why I'll watch people on Instagram or whatever, and they'll say, yeah, ADHD people are like this. And then they describe right. something and they're describing somebody who has a you know, really big right brain right. and left brain deficits. 
And then another person will get on and go, yeah, I'm ADHD and ADHD people are like this. And then they'll describe the complete opposite. Totally. And I'll be like, okay, you just described a left brain ADHD. You're describing a right brain over, you know, and so type one ADHD, which is just the inattentive type, not hyperactive, not impulsive, is more commonly associated with a left brain deficit and really is usually more associated with a learning disability or dyslexia or processing disorder and usually seen in people that are really creative or athletic or really social um, people that may really be talented and you know again may also be associated with anxiety and rejection sensitivity like fear of rejection but the real like the adhd that's more commonly what we think of as the classic adhd is a right brain delay and that's type type two and type three where type two is the hyperactive impulsivity along with the inattentiveness. And that is usually people that are highly intelligent, highly intellectual, but really not, don't get social cues very much. They, they struggle with reading maybe other people's emotions a little bit. And the right brain is what generates sustained attention. So the ability to like sit in class for a long time, even when you're bored and be able to do that. Um, And so, again, they're completely different, but yet they'll both go out there and say, well, I'm ADHD or I'm ADD or I, you know, and yet Mm -hmm. they may be completely opposite people. And this can be very confusing. And to me, that's why. It only makes sense when you look at it neurobiologically, right? It doesn't make sense otherwise. Right. And I could explain all of that. So the first thing is that someone may have a diagnosis or a label and they believe that they're this way. And, you know, it may be a wrong diagnosis. It doesn't mean they don't have a developmental imbalance in their brain. They do. And they may be very gifted in certain things, but their label may not fit it but that's what they believe and that and and therefore the treatment probably won't be very effective Mm -hmm. um, because if there is a treatment out there that might help like a certain medication they may take the wrong medication so therefore so this is where a lot of the confusion comes in it's that Mm -hmm. you know it's different between just ticking a bunch of symptoms and saying oh you fit this versus saying well what is actually happening in the brain and and you know i say this a lot when i'm being interviewed but when i speak to a parent or a patient, and I get people literally from all over the world that have been everywhere and been to the best people in their country, Mm -hmm. and they'll come in, and the first question I ask, or one of the first is, has anybody tried to describe to you what's actually happening in your child's brain or in your own brain? And they all look at me like, no, no one's even talked about that. Like, I even forgot it. I didn't really even look at it from a brain thing, right? I thought it was just my gut, right? And so... It's that's the whole thing. I look at it from, okay, what you're telling me is telling me the story of your brain and your brain development. And then from that story, I can piece together what are your unusual strengths? What are your unusual weaknesses? Mm -hmm. And then how do we create balance in your body? And and that that picture explains everything about you. It explains why you have gut problems or why you can't eat certain foods or, you know, why you have your acid reflux or why you have rheumatoid arthritis or why, you, you know, you supposedly have parasites in your gut. I mean, it tells us everything. Mm. Yeah, I know. We haven't even gotten deep into all the like neuroimmunology and all the biological impacts because they like, you know, just read his books and listen to his podcasts and, you know, follow him on social media. Like you have so much good information out there because you do get, it's not like you're, you know, forsaking the biological side. You're really into that also, but you're just trying to provide this foundational understanding, which I really appreciate. And I feel like my audience will kill me if I don't get into the autism thing a little bit (laughs) with you, since that is like such a strong area, Um, you know, from all the way from when you published disconnected kids, um, reconnected kids, you know, what, what, I guess in these last, you know, five minutes that we've got here, what would you say to adults who are, you know, have autism themselves all the way to parents, children, you know, how are they being underserved and what do they need to know and where can we steer them in a more helpful direction? Yeah, I think, you know, and there's such a wide range of different 
presentations, which also lends to the confusion. Yeah. You get people on the super high end of it that are, you know, incredibly bright and intellectual, but yet, you know, are struggling with certain things. There's very few people out there, you know, and I, and I, I get the whole neurodivergent movement and I, I support it obviously completely. Um, you know, people should always be treated with kindness and respect. Mm -hmm. But, you know, put it this way, if someone's coming to see me and they have a diagnosis, it's because they, they have struggles. Right. And, and there's almost nobody in with an autism diagnosis that isn't struggling with certain things, whether it's anxiety or whether it's, again, some sort of immune issue or mm -hmm. digestive issue or whether it's, you know, not um, struggling socially. Mm -hmm. um, but so there's a wide variety. And, you know, I spend a lot of my time on the end where they're not speaking which is really okay. the more severe end of it. Mm -hmm. and they're, But they're all the same underlying issue. They're just slightly varying degrees, but they present very different, meaning you can have someone that's very, very verbal and articulate, but again, not good with nonverbal communication, doesn't always read social cues, mm -hmm. and again, maybe very hypersensitive to the world around them and everything seems too fast and bright and loud or mm -hmm. you know, overly sensory. Um, and then on the other end of it, you can have a kid that, you know, isn't speaking and they may hardly feel anything. I mean, they have almost no pain sensation or they may not feel hungry or thirsty or uh, not have that. But essentially, again, to me, it starts with every person I have ever worked with with autism that really has not a genetic. So there are some people with a genetic mutation. It's about five to 10% of people in the autism community that are labeled with autism. And that's different. Like when you think about fragile X or down syndrome or something like tuber sclerosis, that's one thing. The majority don't have any genetic mutations and they have these developmental imbalances and all of them, basically it starts off with their geniuses. We may not be able to see, or they may not be able to show us you know, their savant level skills, and not all of them have the, the super savant level skills, but they're all brilliant with their left brain. Their left brain skills are just off the chart. That's what starts it all. And you look at their parents, and you look at their siblings, and they all have these left brain skills, or at least somebody in their family does that they take after, whether it's their grandfather or their grandmother or whatever. And it starts with that gift. And it's super strong. So anybody on that spectrum, it starts with their left brain is better than most other people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're brilliant. Mm -hmm. And, but their right brain is really vulnerable. And, you know, that right brain development in the womb in those first three years, it's all dependent on that, especially for males. And anything that delays that, anything that alters that is going to have the potential to lead to an actual diagnosis of autism spectrum. So it is built on a trait. So when we talk about neurodiversity, this is the trait, this is who they are, this is their personality. But now you put that in an extreme version and now it actually fits a diagnosis. They go from being just a really super smart person that may not have the greatest emotional intelligence, but are fully functional Mm -hmm. to being somebody who may be completely non-speaking, stimming wow. all the time, wow. full of tics, full of eczema in their body, all of these things. And mm -hmm. the idea, though, is that there's no damage, there's no injury in their brain. If, any, if anything, their brain works better in many, in many ways than other people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no genetic mutation in, in any of them, right? They may be altered gene expression, but they're not gene mutations. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is the profile in, in autism is this, again, this right brain delay, this left brain being really strong um, and males normally. So what we've been able to show in our research, it's just this maturational delay and imbalance where the brain was slowed down in his maturation and then developed this imbalance. And now one side of the brain is maturing much faster than the other side and at the wrong time. So the left brain comes online too early. It shuts down this right brain development. So they may not have that drive to attach to other people. 
They may not be able to have that nonverbal communication of reading other people's facial expression, tone of voice as well. They may not really be as connected to their body, so they don't really feel their own body as much. And they don't even know this because this is all they've known. And as I said, most of that stuff, we really developed that awareness in the first three years. And none of us remember learning that. We just feel like it's mm -hmm. intuitive to us. It's there. Mm -hmm. So they don't know that they didn't learn it. And they don't realize that they're not doing what other people can do just instinctively mm -hmm. because they don't know. But they're really smart and they know they're really smart. Even the ones that don't speak, it's pretty amazing because mm -hmm. we have a way of working with them where we can get them to type on a letter board. They may not be able to type on a keyboard or write because they don't have that control over their body. Um, that's the reason why they don't speak because they don't feel their body. They're not connected to their body. They don't know where their body is. They actually tell us my tongue is, I don't feel my tongue or I don't know where my body is unless I'm looking at it. I don't feel it and wow. I can't control it. So when you're looking at it at the end of the spectrum where they're not speaking and they're stimming and ticking all the time and they seem like they don't know anything, they know everything. It's all there. All the words are there. They're brilliant, but wow. they're trapped. They're trapped in a body that they can't feel and they can't control. And so just imagine how how yeah. frustrating that could be. Right. And so some of them get violent and aggressive because they're so pissed off and people mm -hmm. treat them like they're dumb or like they don't mm -hmm. know anything or ignore them or talk around them like they're not there. Imagine what that would feel like. And these are the majority of people that I work with. And so my mission in life is to understand this and to unlock that and, mm -hmm. and give this person a voice somehow and let other people recognize them and see them and understand that they're there and that they're actually brilliant and they're probably smarter than you. Amazing. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. So powerful. Um, if you guys want to learn more about the autism side of things, like you have disconnected kids, reconnected kids, there's disconnected kids nutrition plan, and then autism is the name of your most recent book, correct? All by oh, yeah. No, Dr. Yes. Robert Melillo. So yeah, check those out. And then like what you have like a training for other professionals or something like that too, don't you? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we have a course that I put together over the last 25 years or so, which is a high level uh, fellowship course for health professionals. But we also have non-health professionals and even parents. At the last time we were finishing this cor course up in New York at the TWA airport, we had five moms of kids that we work with from Germany. And they flew in every month for 10 months mm -hmm. because they just wanted to do everything they could and wow. learn everything they could about helping yeah. their child because they saw the results we got and they were like, okay, this is it. I'm in hundred mm -hmm. percent. And, um, but yeah, so it's an online course now that we've done, mm -hmm. we just finished it up live, but it's online and anybody can register and, and take those courses. It's about 150 hours worth of course material with an online test. And then when you do that, then you can qualify to sit for a certification or a fellowship degree. Yeah. And so it, um, is Dr. Robert com where you would refer people to, to, cause you yes. have yeah, like your, your New York office link on there, virtual programs, courses, books, everything's on there. So doctor, it's just DR on the URL guys, Dr. Robert. And then Melillo is First one's one L, second one's two, M E L I L L O. <laughs> so you're man, good. Wow. You're, you're really good. You got that. That's how I describe it. You're very good. <laughs> I know how it is when I'm trying to see it in my head while I'm listening to a podcast <laughs> driving. It's like, give it to me, give it to me. <laughs> Single L, then double L. All right. Um, thank you so much. Wow. I was so honored to have you on the podcast. I'm so excited to share your work with my people because I think they're just going to. Yeah, they're going to latch on and get pretty excited. So thank you yep. so much for everything you're doing. And thank you for taking the time to share with us today. Thank you, Tara. It was, really, it was really great. You really, again, did a great job. And this is such an important topic for people. So I'm just glad yes. we can get it out there. So thank you. Yeah, thank you.